down. Reel down again. Little step. Little oh my God. One or two at a time. That's, that's Let's insane. Go. What's up, everybody? Caleb here with the Fish and Fuel podcast. I'm so glad that you decided to, uh, to tune in today. I've got a very good friend of mine, a special guest, somebody who definitely knows catfishing in my eyes, inside out, uh, Timothy London. Timothy, introduce yourself, kind of tell everybody uh, where you're from, what bodies of water that you normally fish, uh, a little bit about yourself. Absolutely. Uh, Timothy London, I've been uh, catfishing all my life. I recently uh, got into tournament fishing uh, about seven years ago. Um, main main lake I fish, Kerr Lake, Lake Gaston. Um, recently started venturing out more, you mm -hmm. know, the Yak and Chain, um, James River. Santee Cooper. Um, hoping to get out west towards the Tennessee River real soon. Yeah. Um, but here on the East Coast, I mean, you've been all the way up and down at just about going to bodies of water from tidal reservoirs to lake reservoirs to I mean, you name it. You 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 hop around so Yeah, yeah. I like I like the challenge, uh something different, you know. That's right. And you you've done really well. It, it even uh, from just a recreational standpoint, just going out there and, and targeting uh, trophy catfish to fishing tournaments in different locations, which why I thought, you know, Timothy would be a great guy to have on the podcast because you have a, a, a really good track record for being able to pinpoint and catch trophy catfish on different bodies of water. Yeah. Yeah. I've definitely put the time in and the effort, you know, and that's mainly what it resorts back to, you know, time on the water. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, let's, let's start talking. Let's get, let's get into some, uh, some questions. You know, I'm going to pretty much just ask you questions. Like I'm somebody who, uh, could be a tournament angler or somebody just kind of starting out, you know, what's some of the things that I would like to know, or our listeners would might want to know that, uh, that you have found that work for you when you're out on the water. Um, as far as targeting, uh, trophy catfish, you know, if you're pulling up at a new body of water, uh, let's say uh, Kerr Lake, that's home of the world record for anybody listening. Uh, you know, you're pulling up at the lake. Real quickly, you know, what are you normally looking for or what determines where you're going to fish on that lake and how you're going to fish, whether it's anchored, whether it's drifting. If I'm pulling up in my boat, What's some of the things that I need to be thinking about on how I'm going to target them that day? Uh, the biggest factor, of course, is, is weather. You know, I always, I'm a firm believer in looking at the weather, the pressure. Um, I go as far as when I'm in route to the lake. Yeah. I look at cows, deer movement. You look at cows? Yes. Tell us about that. That's interesting. Um, I've heard that before. Animals are, are creatures, you know, you know, they're, they do the same thing a lot. You know, they're, they, they get into a pattern. Yes, they get into a pattern. Same way with fish. Um, if I'm on the way to the lake and I see cows up moving, feeding, you know, it don't always work out that way. But I've noticed 90% of the time cows are up moving active. Same way with deer. If they're real active. Yeah. You know, if you see a bunch of them on the side of the road on the way to the lake, most of the time you're going to have a good day on the water too. Really? You have seen that prove you know, time and time again on the way to the lake. Absolutely. Yes. That is fascinating. That's awesome. That's really cool. But I guess if you were traveling to the lake, you had a day off and the cows were sitting down, you won't go turn around and go back home, would you? No, I'm going to the lake. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm there, if I'm on the way, it, it, it don't matter what they're doing. I'm going to go regardless. That is so cool. So yeah, go ahead and continue to tell us. So you're, so you're looking at things before you ever even get there. Yes, absolutely. Um, and like I said, the weather, the weather plays a big factor. Um, you know, obviously colder months, me personally, I like to 
anchor down. You know, I'll, I'll target a specific area, ledges, deeper structure. And, um, you know, I'll find fish and I'll just, I'll sit on them. Yeah. Um, you know, you said, you know, deeper ledges and stuff like that. It's fascinating when I, when I work with different anglers or I go in different parts of the country, deep and shallow to some people is totally different. You know, it's, it's funny. I, I'll tell somebody, yeah, man, we was catching them shallow, you know, and, uh, somebody be like, yeah, we was catching them shallow the other day in 25 foot. And I'm like, dude, I'm talking about like two foot, three foot. When you're looking, when you said in a lot of the colder months, you target that those catfish, you know, on those deeper ledges, how, how deeper, how deep do you normally look at? Um, it, a big factor is, you know, the specific lake you're fishing, mm -hmm. uh, Curl Lake gets on up to a hundred plus foot in some areas. Um, deeper water to me, 30 and deeper, you know, yeah. 30, 35, 40 foot, um, you know, get on that ledge and, um, they like to transition suns out, you know, they'll come up on that in that shallow flat and chase bait around um right majority of the day and then when it cools back off you know they'll just transition back down later in the evening yes and um another big thing is birds um i always watch the birds if there's some around you know where's the bait at you know the birds follow the bait especially early in the mornings late in the afternoons um mm -hmm. you'll see them and most of the time you find you find the bait you know you, you find the catfish that's exactly right. So there's already a lot of things. If a guy's going to, you know, we go to the lake, we get excited. We got the tunes jamming. We're joking with who we're riding with. But once you start getting close, you can already start dialing in your technique for the day. You're looking at nature on the way as far as like cows and deer activity. You're looking at pressure, um, bar uh, uh, barometric pressure. Yes. Um, I know there's apps for that. You've, you're looking at when you're at the boat ramp, if you see birds working, Yes. In most all lakes and really a lot of rivers, they've got that bridge that crosses over the body of water. I guess when you're going over, that's a good time to kind of see if there's birds, kind of help you determine which direction. Yes, um, especially Kerr Lake, you know, the big yeah. bridge in Clarksville. That's um, right. You can get a good view both ways. Um, you know, and like I said, wintertime, you know, it's it's hit or miss as far as, you know, where the fish may or may not be. Um right. Sometimes, you know, you catch them on a warm day, you know, you're going 30 up to, like you said, two, three, four foot of water. Right. Um, cooler days, overcast, you know, they might push a little bit deeper. Um, but, you know, the general general consensus is if you find the birds, you know, you find the bait, most of the time you're going to find active fish. Yeah, yeah. Feeding. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm at the boat ramp. I've kind of determined you know in my opinion you know based off your experiences how the activity might be as far as the fish bite just judging by what i've seen uh it seems to be you know some birds working or or you know or maybe not um when i put my my boat in the water uh do you look at anything with wind you know whether there's a ripple on the water which direction the wind's blowing do you use wind at all as a, as a sign of of what your approach might be? Yes. Um, I have like, I will look back a few days prior to see if the wind has been blowing the same direction. Um, and so you're looking for consistent wind direction. Absolutely. Cause you know, over a period of days, wind blowing the same direction, it'll push that bait to one side or the other side of the lake, you know, absolutely depending. Right. And, um, most time, if you find the bait stacked up on one side, you know, fish follow, they follow suit a lot, you know, and um, they will not be far behind wherever the bait is. Right, right. So if you're if you're looking at the map and you, I'm looking at my lake and and I'm seeing where the wind has been blowing from the west a lot. You know, it's probably a good idea to, coming from the west. Um, it it's probably a good idea to look at that bank that's the wind is hitting on the on the other side. Um, yeah. that is blowing into absolutely um a big santee is notorious for that um santee cooper in south yes, carolina absolutely uh lake moultrie and lake marion um moultrie is like a big pond it's just yeah. huge wide i believe it's 10 miles wide at some point 11 or 12 miles long absolutely but uh it will blow you know a lot out of the north um 
especially in the wintertime, north, northwest. So, uh, you know, over a period of days, all that bait will push to the south side. You know, the waves going across, it just beats the south side of the lake. And, um, you know, over a period of days, the bait will just pile up on that side of the lake, man. And uh, if you get your pressure rising, warmer days, um, you know, good fishing weather, I mean, them fish will just, they will be fired up on the on the whole other side of the lake, you know. That's something, that's that's great. And a lot of times, you know, that wind, we know, you know, pushes plankton, which is something that uh, the bait fish feed on. And then the catfish and the other species are, are there feeding on them as well. You know, and it's one of them things, Timothy, that, that we as anglers, uh, it seems like, you know, sometimes we get stuck on, you know, well, let's turn the fish finder on and let's start looking. And that is important. And that's when you're, you have to get to the right location first before those types of tools will work for you. And everything you've mentioned, I absolutely love it because we're talking about techniques that put guys in the right location because you can spend money on a $10,000 setup for electronics. But if you're not in the right location, they're not going to help you. You just went out there and just looked at your graph all day. But looking at wind and the direction like you're talking about, that's already putting you in the right place to catch trophy catfish. Absolutely. It'll put you in a general area. And then that's when your depth finder comes into play. You know, mm -hmm. uh, common knowledge is the biggest denominator in fishing. Yep. Um, you know, common sense too. Um, if you find a technique and you know it works, you know, if you know the wind's been blowing that way, get go to the opposite end and turn your depth finder on and start scanning. That's right. Most of the time you'll see what, you, you know, you'll get a general area or idea or you'll see what you like, you know, if you use, you know, your common knowledge on the way to the lake. That's right. That's right. And I tell, I've told guys before, you know, if you do get out there and you apply these principles and you're scanning and you're not seeing a lot of fish, don't get discouraged. Like continue to look in different areas for that, with that same principle, yeah. you know, don't, don't get discouraged and then throw all the, the, the rules out the, the door. You know, I mean, there are plenty of times where we feel like fish should be doing this fish should be here and they do something else. But I feel like the things that you're talking about and talking with other anglers and being in the industry and, and being a former catfisher myself, those things will work for you time and time again, just as it, it has for you. I mean, and and brought some of the fish in the boat that, uh, for these guys, just like it has for you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, like I said, a good buddy of mine, uh, told me a while, a long time ago. It's one of the first things he told me, uh, Dale Lowe. Yeah. Dale Lowe. He said, go with your gut. Yeah. Don't never second guess. You know, a lot of people make the mistake of they'll have a plan. Yep. And when you get to the lake, you just want to flip it, you know, and do yep. something totally different. And most of the time that's a mistake. Yep. It is. I have found. When I was fishing before before the brand, before Catch the Fever brand, before anything, uh, when I was beating the boat ramps, I mean, a lot of times when maybe I should have been working, <laughs> I found where I had a game plan. I looked for the conditions. And if I had like maybe a couple people that was going with me that day, sometimes I'd let other people kind of maybe get in my head and change my game plan instead of listening to my gut. That's so important because if you listen to your gut, you, you've done your homework or, you know, you've listened to podcasts like these tips and, and, and techniques, you went out on the water, applied it for yourself. Don't let somebody change your mind. You know, go with your gut is telling you on the water. Absolutely. And I mean, it's, it's okay to take other people's advice, you, you know, and, yeah. and, and mold it into what you're doing. It's a balance. Yes. Yes. And I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm my own biggest critic. You right. know, when it comes to right. stuff like that, if I do something and it don't work, you know, I, I document it. I note it. Right. And uh, it's a process of elimination. That's right. And then eventually, you know, especially if you fish the same body of water, you, you'll develop a pattern. That's you'll, right. You'll know what the fish are going to do. You know, if you fish one body of water consistently, yeah. you know, you'll, you'll wake up in the morning, or, you know, wind's blowing this way. I'm, and you'll already know where you need to be to start marking quality fish. That's right. That's right. Yeah. I, and, and, and if you, if you are somebody, you know, you listen to this podcast or, you know, you're, you're, you're trying to improve your technique for, for targeting trophy catfish or you're fishing tournaments. Yeah. No, definitely don't uh, 
rule out your your partner or, or somebody who's giving you some advice. I mean, thinking differently a lot of times can help you as well. But when it comes to what you've learned and going with your gut, go with your gut and uh, and work together, you know, yeah. for sure. But, uh, but yeah, don't overthink it. I think that's another thing Dale Lowe says. And for anybody, if you don't know who Dale Lowe is, I don't know where you've been <laughs> the last couple of years. Uh, the guy, he, he caught, which he has caught the biggest catfish uh, on a big cat fever rod, which is made by our company, Catch the Fever, um, at 141 pounds. Yes. I mean, just pounds away from the world record. Uh, I was glad I was able to be there that day when that fish was caught. You were there as well. Yeah, he uh, he actually called me on the phone, man, and he yeah. said, "Uh, I think I just put the world record in the boat." And, um, I heard the same thing. We're like, Dale, do you do you realize what you're saying there? And he sent me a picture of Chase beside that fish, and I said, "Whoa!" I knew it was. If it wasn't, it was really close. Uh, I actually uh, I reeled all my stuff in and went to the ramp, man. Yeah, you know, I was. We did the same thing. I was pumped to see it, you know, and. Yeah. When he pulled that fish out the live well, I was like, whoa. I mean, it's one of the moments where your mind, 141 pound catfish, like your mind just, it, it's trying to understand what you're seeing. Yes. I have never seen, you know, the eye, just the eyes on that fish, you Huge. know. Silver yes. dollars. Yes. Yes. It's definitely something, you know, you would not want to miss. No, you wouldn't. So, you know, Dale is somebody I plan to have here on the podcast as well. I mean, I mean you got a guy that's, uh, that's his second fish at a hundred pounds, you know, who, who does really well. Um, I mean, he's a great guy and, and, you know, anytime he's talking about catfish and I'll listen to it too, he's got a lot of good advice. I mean, it works for him. Absolutely. Um, so back to, to, to being on the water and, and kind of dialing in your approach, uh, walking, walking us back through, you know, going to the boat ramp, looking for, uh, the telltale signs that's above the water. Uh, and then kind of watching the wind, getting the history on which way the wind's going. Now we've just pinned down, you know, where we're going to start fishing. Um, that's when for you, is that when, you know, you turn your electronics on, that's when it becomes handy. Um, you know, when you're in the right location, there's different things to look for. There's shallow flats in the right location of the lake. And then there's deep ledges. There's, uh, you know, debris on the banks. Some of them are sand banks. I guess by season that may change for what you're, you're looking for, but kind of right now we're in the month of March coming into early spring. What, 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 what do you look for when you get in the right location that you feel you turn your graph on? Is there any type of structure? Yeah, it's, um, it's still a little early for, for flatheads, but I don't rule them out. You know, uh, you know, depending on the water temperature, you know, they, they start waking up, you know, late March, early April, and, uh, and they'll hit cup bait around here. And in, in a minute, yes, yeah. and um, during that time. And another factor, uh, a lot of people don't talk about is whether you go shallow or deep or whatnot is current. Mm -hmm. You know, the current, um, Kerr Lake, you know, it floods a lot, a uh, ton of structure. Um, I will, I will go through there and scan, you know, and um, I will scan the structure you know, several times on each side, you know, and on down imaging. And um, yeah. I will look for those to see if fish are holding on that structure. You know, then they might not always be hugged up to a tree or hugged up to a brush pile. Right. You know, if they're actively feeding, they might be moving around. Um, right. You know, just all, it all depends. You know, it goes back to, you know, the weather and what they're, you know, if they're actively feeding, you might have to, I like, I like to switch to drifting sometimes when they're on the move. Right. You know, and, um, but sometimes you get lucky and, um, uh, you can mark them on that structure and, uh, you know, you pull up in front of it, anchor, kind of ease back to it and throw to it and, um, have an awesome day, you know, in, in one spot sometimes. Yeah. Never have to move really. Yeah. And, um, I've had that happen at, at Kerr, you know, uh, we set up there one night and, um, I marked a ton of fish and, um, it was in April. Yeah. I knew the flathead bite was going to pick up and all that. And, um, it had been warmer and, uh, we sat in one spot up there in the flats. Anybody knows fish's cur knows the flats and, um, up towards the river. And, uh, we caught 19, 19 flatheads and 16 blues in one spot. That's killer. Yeah. Describe that spot to me because 
that is something when you catch that many fish, there is something significant about that area that is attracting those fish to be there. What just, you know, obviously as fishermen, we don't want to tell where we fish and where we caught them yeah. all the time. I mean, cause I mean, there's sweat equity into finding good spots and stuff, <laughs> but for a guy, you know, who's listening, what is significant about that spot that you think was holding the fish there that he could take and replicate on his home body of water? What do you, what do you think it was? Okay. So a general idea of the spot. Well, um, all right. So you got two rivers feeding Kerr Lake, Stanton river, Dan river. That's um, right. In the middle, there's a big flat. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you know, in the summertime, uh, they keep the water level around 300. They, they get it there. They start getting it there in the spring where it stays consistent. Yeah. But, um, it was, what I noticed is when I, when I was scanning across there is there was a channel that runs between both rivers, you know, right. the, a visible channel that you could see on your side image and on mapping and on mapping. Yes. So you looked at your map, saw where, huh? This looks like a good area that I need to be fishing in. I see there's a channel on my lake mapping card. I'm going to go over there and then you spot it on your fish finder. Yes. And, um, I, I scanned it, um, side scan and, uh, down imaging. And, you know, it's almost, it was almost like a pathway between the two main channels. And, um, you know, it was like flat, that little secondary channel back up to a flat yep. and then your river channels on both sides. So it was almost like an ambush point. Right. And, um, I went up above it. Um, I scanned it, noticed there was some fish in there. Um, I went up above it, anchored and let my rope out and kind of eased back to it, you know? Right. And then I, I fan casted, uh, the whole, the whole channel and up, up, up on the flat. I like to get both aspects if I'm on a ledge or, you know, and like in a secondary channel. You want to end the channel above the channel, off to the side of the channel, anywhere around it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, it, that night it was, it was, it was pretty wild, man. I mean, just that's fish awesome. after fish. That's awesome. There's so much good information right there. I mean, you know, a lot of times with, with trying to catch catfish, you, you want to find stuff that's different and not to say they're just not roaming on a mud, a mud flat that has nothing on it. If the bait's there, they will be on that mud flat. But like I tell people, you know, or even if it's in the summer, they're looking for mussels and stuff like that. You know, a, a catfish on a nothing bank is what I call it. The only reason they're going to be there is for food. But whether they're looking to feed, they just fed kind of in between those transition periods, like we're talking about, is where they'll hang out. Yes. And and if they're not, you know, feeding currently at that time, they'll go and, and sit in those areas so they don't have to travel very far to get back to the food source. Yeah. If, if, if the weather's stable for, you know, s right. several days, your bait will hold, have a tendency to hold in a, in a you know, a rel relatively close area. Yeah. And your catfish are not going to stray far away from the bait source. Right. You know, it's easy access. Don't have to work real hard for it, you know, and they're not swimming around, you know, for miles on end looking for, looking for bait. That's right. That's right. That's great. Cause you know, like we just talked about guys, I mean, there's so much good information that, that Timothy's really given us to where when we go to a spot, he's using his lake map card. That's why a good lake map card is so important. I got guys where I've had their like, Hey, look, I got side imaging. Hey, look, I just got this and that. And I'm like, great. What kind of lake maps card you got? Oh man, that thing was in an extra 200 bucks. I didn't get one. And I'm thinking that's the most important part. The make the lake card drains the lake for you, mm -hmm. and you're able to see every hump, every ditch, like what you're talking about. And you, as an angler, you should definitely invest in a good lake maps card and a lakes uh, a mapping unit on your unit because, like Timothy said, he saw it on his on his lake map. Said, "Huh, this is the right area. This looks like something different. This looks like a highway that these fish would travel. I'm going to anchor up." And it was. It was, it was a successful day. It sounds yeah. like. Yeah. Sure. And you know, some, even some of the best lake maps, you don't, you don't have certain lakes like mine. Right. Mine don't have Tuckertown Reservoir. Right. So Navionics is my best friend there Yeah, on, on my phone. You go to Navionics app, you download that. Yes. And I have it on there and uh, it has Tuckertown. So I use it 
at Tuckertown, you know, and I don't have it on my depth finder. So, but, and you know, it, it shows you everything a regular lake map card would. Yeah. You know, it's, it's your best friend. I mean, I know people that's, you know, they go out there and, and you just wing it. And, um, then they text you the next morning, man, it was the worst night ever. You know, I didn't, I didn't catch no fish or I, I caught one fish all night. You know, you know, you got to know where to start, That's you right. know, in order to, in order to catch the fish. That's right. I tell people all the time, if you want to get fed, you got to get in the buffet line. Absolutely. You know, you're hungry and, and you're standing out in the middle of nowhere. You're not going to find any food out there. I mean, so, uh. Yeah, if you're hungry, you got to get in the buffet line. If you want to to catch the fish, you got to get to where the fish are. Absolutely, and where they're feeding. Yeah, so that makes that 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 makes a lot of sense. And you know, you, you had hit on if the weather you know doesn't change that month that much. Uh, let's say today is high of 45 outside. You know, the water temperature is still cold around here. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and you got an idea of where you're going to be fishing. How much, how, how, how far have you seen a fish, like the, the pattern move from where you were catching them when you have like one night or a couple days of like temperature shift where an even colder front comes through or a, a big warm front comes through? Yeah, I've, uh, I've seen them, I've seen them move in a, in a period of just one night, like fishing, like I get out there at six o'clock in the afternoon, you know, get my bait get set up actively catching fish and then you know i know there's a front coming through i Mm -hmm. I looked at the weather um and then they just cut off like a switch um you know me looking at the weather i anticipate that right so you know i'm automatically thinking of what i'm going to do next you know and depending on the weather um cold front rain you know something wind coming in you know most of the time they'll push my opinion they'll push deep yeah you know they'll go deeper so if I'm up a on a whole front comes through, you generally, and then you go back to where you, you've been catching them and it's not as much activity. Your first reaction is to, let me check a little bit deeper. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's just, you know, and if it really throws me for a curve ball and, um, some people agree with it, some people don't, you know, each fisherman has their own way. Um, that's right. if I'm, if I'm kind of stumped on what to do as far as like, they've really moved on me a lot. Weather's permitting, I'll put a drift sock out. Right. I'll start covering water. Right. And for anybody who's, who's just starting out, a drift sock is, uh, if you, you can Google uh, a drift sock, uh, you throw it out either behind your boat or on the side of your boat, and you're you're not anchored up. You're letting the wind push the side of the boat, and it's slowing you down. You know, one thing you can do in the wintertime is uh, drift too fast or catfish absolutely their metabolism slows down and they want to 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 get that bait a lot slower they have to look at it for an extra second yeah. so you can throw that drift sock out and it will slow you down you know to where you're not running the baits right by the fish it, it gives them a second to, to absolutely react. yeah how how when you when you talk about drifting um how fast do you normally drift what's like the standard and then you will go up to this speed like during the summer when they're more active. And then, you know, what's, what, what's, what's the norm for you? My norm is around between 0.5 and 0.7. Um, that's the norm. And you're uh, looking at your fish finder to make sure that you're staying at that speed. Absolutely. Yes. And, um, winds up, I'll put a drift sock out. I usually put one out anyway, cause it helps with boat control. Right. You know, if you're using a trolling motor, um, helps keep the boat straight. And, that's um, right keeps you a nice spread on the back with the uh, planter boards and um winter time i'll slow it down um especially if i know the bite's going to be slow um 0. 0.2 0. 0.3 you know i'll come to a pretty much a creep and um it gives gives the bait plenty of time to get in front of the fish right and the fish to to make a decision you know whether they want to bite it or just let it go on by that's right that's exactly right that's good information timothy man that's good and you mentioned bait you know, a lot of guys, um, they ask about what's the best bait, you know, for catching trophy catfish. And I've always told them that, you know, it's, it's what's native to, to your body of water. Uh, and that's also legal. Um, you know, so check your regulations before you use a certain species in, in a, on a body of water, but, uh, whatever's natural to that body of water is normally a good bait. 
uh, for the majority, since you travel quite a bit going to different lakes and do really well at these places, what's your go-to bait that you're definitely going to have, you know, when, when you're, when you're fishing tournaments or if you're fishing for yourself? Well, like you said, it, it, it resorts back to where you're going. Um, Mm -hmm. some baits, uh, work way better at certain lakes than other ones do. Um, for instance, I've had real good success with crappy at say Lake Gaston. Yep. Um, or big white perch, you know, Mm -hmm. um, Kerr Lake, um, springtime, uh, late winter. I love white perch air. Um, transition starts, you know, spring, spring to summer. I, I like to switch to shad or, or, you know, if I'm targeting flatheads, brim, live yeah. brim, sunfish, yep, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, and uh, even a big crappy, you know, that's you right. Know, as long as it's over the legal limit. Absolutely. You know, and, um, but you know, the majority, you know, you always want to have some fresh shad. I mean, this, yeah. you know, if, if I had to, choose it would be between shad or white perch right to take anywhere to in order to fish yeah that's that's what i would say is as well and i think a, a, another thing that sometimes guys over uh overlook is what season are you in because for me when i was fishing all the time that made a big decision on what i did use like for instance we all know around here in north carolina uh when it gets starts you know around uh, April and stuff, the, the crappies start going up on the, like close to the banks. They're, they're looking to start spawning mm-hmm. and those catfish know that. And that's a time where they key in on crappy. So knowing a little bit about what species is doing, what can trigger, you know, what, what the catfish are going after, you know, springtime, I feel like, uh, when those crappy are right up on the bank, I will fish closer to the bank with crappy. I'm not going to go out there and fish with something that's not local to that body of water uh, deep when, you know, I can be on the bank where those crappier are, are, are at, and then I'm going to give them something that they're naturally going to see that time of year, you know, shallow. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, a lot of people overlook that when they go, you know, they don't, mm-hmm. they don't think about what the other native fish are doing. Right. Um, and timing's a big, you know, a big factor in that if, right. If, you know, I've seen be anchored up in a creek or something, uh, you know, three, four foot of water. Mm-hmm. And you can sometimes see the catfish over on the bank just that's, ambushing that's right. something, you know, that's a lot right. of activity. And um, if you if you watch stuff like that, I mean, the catfish will pretty much tell you what to do, you know. Exactly, exactly. And it's really just a observation. You know, how many times have you walked when this summertime, you walk down to the, the boat dock and you look at the water and you see the sunfish like right around the dock that lets me know you know if if i'm fishing shallow or around the rivers or anywhere you know like that i know the brim and the sunfish are shallow in the winter time those sunfish stuff they go deeper you know 25 30 foot absolutely so for me sometimes i always thought you know ah brim wouldn't be a good winter time bait but if i was going to use brim i would use it in deeper water because in the wintertime brim go deep and that's where they got those catfish are still eating brim they may prefer a shad but they are still eating them and so fishing with that bait for listeners you know i think fishing with that bait where the fish are used to seeing it plays a big role absolutely um another thing is uh the a lot of people don't like it but I'm okay with it. Is is the mayfly hatch? You know. Oh, this is a good. Th- I know where you're going with this. This um, is good stuff. Mayflies. It's good information. They they tend to hatch a, a lot on the banks of Kerr Lake. Right. Um, and if you pay attention, you know, you'll look up under the tree, especially if it's hanging over the water, and it'll be a ton of bait fish there. I mean, just you know, you could drop a worm in there and just you could pull them out with a bare hook, probably. Yep. And um, you know goes back to bait fish you know if bait fish are there the catfish are not far away that's exactly right you know, and i and i use i use that tool especially if if i'm trying to catch bait i yep. will find a mayfly nest near over the water and i will go there and i'll you know you can catch 50 brim in a matter of no time yep you know and then you're all fishing yep but that also tells you where the catfish are going to be or, or if they're not there they're not far from it that's exactly right my my business partner and good friend tony caton we was going fishing one time and uh 
we saw a may mayflies hatch off this big rock down by the river and they were swarming this rock and this rock was just completely covered it had just went down before us and the water was exploding we stopped and just witnessed it and it was brim and bluegill just grabbing them off the top of the water it was the it was like striper hitting shad on top of the water and that is exactly what i feel like what you're talking about you know don't get out there and see the mayflies and be like oh man these stupid mayflies you know i'm trying to maybe a good bait to use would be a sunfish something that would be feeding on those mayflies perch feed on mayflies as well maybe say look i'm gonna go tomorrow and i'm gonna target that mayfly area where there was a bunch of mayflies and i'm gonna use something that's eating mayflies yeah because the catfish in that area are going to be eating that absolutely and um that's killer information yes and uh you know it don't a lot of people don't like them they're inconvenience you know they they love the lights on your boat. They can be an yes. inconvenience, and, uh, but they it, can also tell you a lot of information. Yes, and they, I mean, you know, they're your best friend when you go to catch bait. I mean, right? You can drop a, you know, you can drop a barrel hook there, and uh, you know, catch bring them back to back to back sunfish, you know, bluegill, and um, you know, I'm not against going right up above that mayfly nest. Turn around and throw the same brim right back out on the hook. Sure, <laughs> and you know, absolutely. I had a guy tell me one time. He said. Um, once you get good at catching bait, one of, a lot of times he said where he catches his biggest fish is he'll catch bait and then he'll fish right there. He said, you know, if the bait's there, the big fish are there. He said, I'll just kind of transition over, you know, but be in that same area and, and do really well. You yeah. know, so you know, don't yeah. always catch your bait and turn around and go 20 minutes up the, the water. I mean, maybe it's a good spot to fish. And you know, you don't know how many stories I've, I've heard personally of people catching bait. And catching a 30 or 40 pound fish in right. the net, you know? Right. Or how many crappy fishermen were crappy fishing and hooked a big flathead. Absolutely. Over the same, un, under the same bush that they were pulling the crappy out of. Yeah. And you know that, yeah, you, you throw the net and you disturb the water for a little while, but that's still something you need to put in the back of your head when you, when it's time to catfish. That's right. You know, I mean, if, if the, if the catfish are up under that bridge or near that rock pile, I mean, they're there actively feeding because you already know the bait's there right you know they're they're there for a reason and um it's 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 usually a good idea to go back and maybe target that area you know absolutely absolutely well this has been uh, an awesome podcast i mean i i know with your experience timothy and and we could seriously sit here for hours and just dive into so many things but we got to have more episodes for other things you know going down the road so. absolutely just in summary, guys, of, of what Timothy has shared his wealth of knowledge about is, you know, when you get into the, the body of water, be looking on the way for, a, a, you know, how you feel that, you know, the fish are going to be reacting by, by looking at nature, you know, cows, whether they're standing up, whether there's deer activity. When you get there, look at which way the wind's blowing or pull out your phone on your, uh, you can do uh, an app for weather and see the past few days what the wind's been doing look at the, the the water and see which way the wind's pushing it then once you're you know you put your boat in have an idea for what season you're in and 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 in which direction you're going to be going in the lake mm -hmm. and then once you get there uh you know use your lake mapping to see if you can pick out any structure that could be different and i tell guys you know people get confused between structure and cover structure is the bottom contour when it changes cover is stuff like brush piles and log jams and stuff so but use your lake maps to to find structure those different transitions like you just mentioned where there was a ditch that you were able to spot you scanned it there was fish there so you fished it use that information to put you in the right area and then pinpoint where you're going to fish and then also for bait, what you're going to actually fish with them for, know about what time of the year, if there's anything currently running a, a bait fish that's more dominant in that area, um, and and try to have that bait available for those fish. And if you can't, it's always a good idea, like Timothy said, to have uh, shad uh, in the boat um, and use those things uh, to 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 find trophy catfish. Absolutely. So, well, that's all good information guys and i'm so glad that yeah uh, you joined us here uh on the fish and fuel podcast we're going to be having more discussions i'm going to be talking with more um 
you know, great anglers that target trophy catfish. Uh, and also, Timothy, you've been you've been using our 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 products for a while, catch fever products. You know, absolutely. What? Just real quick, I, I know we'll we'll end up doing another podcast when we're talking about the gear, but what what rods by catch fever are you using and running to target trophy catfish? Uh, right now I'm using the uh, medium heavy uh, Hellcat rods. Yeah, the carbon wrapped. Yep. Um, love them. They're great for reservoirs, rivers. I've thrown up to 14 and 16 ounce weights off of them. Yeah. You know they they can handle anything you throw at them. That's awesome. That's and, awesome. Um, you know they they're reliable. Got the real sensitive tip. Um, you know you can you can feel the fish during the fight. You know it's yeah. It's not just like a stiff stick, so to speak. Right. It's, it, it amazes me, you know, when people say, oh, you know, all the catfish rods are the same. It's all, it's all the same. The rod design and how it loads up when you're using circle hooks or, you know, it's, it's critical that a rod with, you know, that will properly load up will catch you more fish. And one that loads up and gets the hook in, now that part's done, but you've got to also have a rod that gives you control to be able to maneuver a fish if you have to absolutely uh the backbone backbone is real key when you're fighting a fish right that uh that sensitive tip you know fish or fish fish can be real finicky and uh you know if you have a real stiff stiff tip you know and they they tug on a little bit and feel that hook or feel something that's not right they're going to drop it and go the other way you know that ability to for that fish to you know, it's too late once he feels it. You know, the rod's loaded up, the hooks, you know, the hooks in him, and then, you know, it's game on. Right. And um, that's, you know, I got a good video of that on YouTube that, you know, that shows that rod, you know, the way it loads up. And, um, you know, once it once it lays over, I, I have 100% confidence that that fish is on there. Yeah. You know, and that's, you know, that's... It's done its job. That's the, you know... That's only half of the battle, of course, getting the fish in, you know, and, um, I've had 70, you know, 72 pound fish at the James river and heavy current on that same medium heavy rod and had no issues at all. That's great. That's great. And if, if you're listening, you want to find out more about the Hellcat rods, you can go to catchfever.com. Uh, they've been a very successful, uh, rod model for cat fishermen. There was a lot of research that went in. We've got videos where we flew those uh rods to idaho i mean getting feedback and testing them on hills canyon um i mean they them rods have been all over the country before we released them we really put the r&d in i'm glad to hear that that's that's you're really enjoying them and uh timothy also there's a big tournament that's going on for if you're a listener you want to come meet timothy and you want to talk to him or and fish a great tournament what's this tournament that you got going on uh what's the name the date and location um we actually have two a good friend of mine is putting one on april 30th at a uh, lake tillery uh king of tillery tournament um it's a night tournament 7 p.m to 8 a.m um last year the first place took home right at ten thousand dollars that's pretty good for a day fishing absolutely fishing. man and um you know it was Tillery's an awesome place in the springtime i mean monster flatheads uh my pb flathead come from there actually yeah um, and some real nice blues. And then um, September, first weekend in September, we got the Flathead Tournament that Team Mako is putting on. Uh, flathead only at Kerr Lake. And um, they should be off the spawn, and they should be hungry by then. They should be chewing. Absolutely. It's a uh, it's 100% payback. We keep nothing. That's awesome, man. Uh, it's for the fishermen. Absolutely. Everything we get from our sponsors, we're giving away. They don't even have to buy a raffle ticket. That's killer. That is, that is so awesome. And we'll make sure that there's plenty of catch the fever gear there. Uh, Timothy and, 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 and the crew from uh, Team Mako Fishing and C2 Outdoor, I mean, you guys just do a lot. I mean, for, for, for being involved with the anglers and putting something on, I think that's awesome. So, guys, again, thank you so much for, for uh, tuning in on this episode. I look forward to talking with more anglers and having Timothy back to really go over a lot more techniques uh and sometime you know on the next one we you know we may talk about river fishing absolutely still a lot of knowledge here that timothy's got that he can just share with today was just a chip off the iceberg uh if you want to listen to more fishing fuel uh podcasts uh be sure to check us out on uh the 
popular podcast channel, Spotify. Uh, you can check us out on YouTube, Facebook page, Fish and Fuel, and also TikTok and Instagram. So if you've got those social media accounts, be sure to go in there, check out this episode and uh, and other episodes and 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 stay tuned and connected to to when new episodes drop that uh, I feel like, you know, it's going to really help anglers catch more fish. Absolutely. Well, Timothy, thank you so much for coming in here today. Guys, we appreciate you watching. And uh, also leave us some feedback uh, below and let us know how we're doing and uh, what maybe you might want to hear next on the next Fish and Fuel podcast.